Hello, everybody. I am Nerd Slayer, your host. This is Six Pixels Under, episode 30. A special episode. On this uh, week's episode, we will be speaking to none other than Chris Avalon. And uh, he's currently uh, joining us in voice right now. So, everybody, please give him a warm welcome. And then also, Chris Avalon, please uh, say hello to everybody. <laughs> Uh, Justin, I'm so sorry. I think I have, I'm still having trouble hearing you. And did you? <laughs> so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Uh, well, we're doing it live. I think everyone else is hearing me and hearing you, but maybe you're not hearing me somehow. Yeah, that's uh, sounds correct. I, uh, I, I think we could just we could just wing it and and just try anyway. If you have anything that uh, you want to ask to the chat, maybe I can also do that too. Where you're like, and now go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, we'll 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 make it work. Um, yeah. So first, I'd like to start off with an introduction. Obviously, for those who don't know who Chris is, um, I will just tell you a little bit about uh, his uh, rap sheet. <laughs> um, he was a designer on Fallout Two. He was a lead designer and writer on Planescape Torment. Uh, of course, he was behind Icewind Dale, Baldur's Gate. Um, he did. You know, my favorite game of all time, I should say. So I'm a little bit biased here. Tour 2 in 2004 as a lead designer and writer. And then, of course, he worked on Neverwinter Nights, another one of my favorite games. <laughs> and then uh, Fallout New Vegas, Pillars of Eternity, Tyranny. And then now, I mean, it, the list goes on. There's, there's way more games, and I, I literally can't even list them all now <laughs> because I would... <laughs> I would need another like hour to just go through all of the honestly like great uh, projects that you've had the ability to work with and be a big contributor in many of them. And first, I just want to say for everybody, I know everyone's thinking it in chat. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for reaching out. I really appreciate it. Yeah, seriously. And I, I, for those who aren't following you, I guess, right at this moment, can you just give everyone a little bit of updates of, of what you're currently working on? Yeah, uh, so I finished up work on a uh, romance uh, slash relationship platformer, which sounds strange to say, uh, called Degrees of Separation um, earlier this year in February, just in time for Valentine's Day. Uh, and I worked with um, a studio called Moondrop uh, Studios, who uh, were a great bunch of guys. They were a small indie team. Uh, and then I also, uh, Bloodlines 2 uh, with Paradox just got announced, and I'm so glad they announced it because it was really hard to keep that one under the hat. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, please, please say something so I could talk about it. Oh my God. Uh, and also, they, uh, they, they, uh, I finished up work on um, uh, Jedi The Fallen Order with uh, Respawn Entertainment, and that also recently got announced at uh, Star Wars uh, Celebration. Um, and, but in terms of things that I'm currently working on, uh, so I'm working on a number of things, but the one that I can publicly talk about is I'm a narrative designer on Dying Light 2. Uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the lead writer for it. I actually work with a team of writers, like including um, uh, some of the writers that worked on uh, The Witcher 3, notably the, the Bloody Baron quest. So we sort of form a writing team and then all contribute to Dying Light 2. And um, there's a bunch of other unannounced projects, but hopefully there'll be more info on that in the coming year. Yeah, wow. I mean, that that's that's a lot of different projects that you're working on. The first question I have with something like that really is just like, how do you do it? <laughs> how do you get involved in so many different projects? Do you ever have a problem with kind of maybe divorcing certain ideologies or maybe like design philosophies from certain games from to other games? Does that ever happen at all, you feel? Um, well, uh you know, job opportunities and uh, the opportunity to work on projects is uh, has been kind of surprising to me. What happens is uh, usually every week or twice a week, uh, there'll be a new job opportunity popping up in the the inbox folder, which is amazing. Uh, I I obviously can't can't take them all, but the um, Usually the amount of work that they require for individual projects varies considerably. So, I mean, for example, so like when um, I was working on uh, FTL Advanced Edition with the Subset Games guys, who, who I also worked on with uh, Into the Breach, 
they uh, they didn't need a lot of writing done for the advanced edition, or at least not nearly as much writing as I was used to with doing RPGs. So like that was the work for them, which I did for free was like only about like two weekends of work to do like you know maybe 120 you know FTL encounters, and then uh, so I sometimes get like project opportunities like that we're like hey we need uh, you know a certain character fleshed out or we could use you know feedback on a story or we could use like you know like an example of 120 encounters for this and then because i have a lot more control over my schedule as a freelancer i'm able to sort of organize the workflow for that and hmm. it's definitely made me a lot more efficient and also um it's given me the opportunity to work with a lot of different teams you know, see what their tool sets are like, uh, you know, work with, you know, developers I've always wanted to work with, like, you know, like Warren Spector, Ken Levine, um, like, I never thought that would be possible. And <laughs> strangely, as a freelancer, like, then those messages pop up in the inbox, like, hey, you know, Ken was wondering if you're free, or, you know, Warren's like, hey, can you help you help, help out with this project? And I'm like, yes, I certainly can. So yeah, it's, um, it's been a really eye opening experience. That's great to hear. And, and it might, it, it, it sounds like um, the, the first thing I thought when you talked about having the uh, freedom was just like your previous work relationships. You know, you have kind of like this interesting work history where I feel like you were like almost with companies that are victim of circumstance in a lot of cases. And I'm not going to say that, you know, these certain companies, I'm not going to name any of them, maybe brought about their own doom. I don't know what happened within them, but um, it's safe to say that they're not often seen as companies that just blew up in a, a you know, a blaze of glory. But I, everybody remembers your relationship and your time spent at Obsidian Entertainment in particular. Um, could, uh, could you either type that question in chat or repeat it? Sorry, I, I got it like about 20% of it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, I actually, uh, I'll, I'll send exactly to you what section I'm on right now. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, about Obsidian. The um, so yeah, I guess the nice thing about Obsidian was uh, so we had um, been doing RPGs in a subset studio, kind of like a. It's not really a false studio, but like it was like a division within a larger company called Interplay Entertainment for like a like a long time. And uh, the whole goal of the division within Interplay was like, hey, well, we make RPGs. Um, but the problem was, as you know, the years went by with Interplay, and then uh, you know Brian Fargo left, um, you know, and taking a lot of the soul of the company with him, uh, we discovered that making RPGs was becoming more and more um, mechanical and excessively time intensive we're like hey well just you know instead of doing like a groundbreaking project like you know um uh, hey work on a new Baldur's gate you know game or a new fallout game we'd get a lot of requests like hey how quickly can you turn out an infinity engine clone and you know x amount of time and for those that are not familiar infinity engine was the code base uh that was bioware had done for Baldur's gate one and Baldur's gate two and basically kept Black Isle Studios alive for quite a period of time. So we would just use their engine and then we would make games like Planescape Torment or Icewind Dale based on that technology because we weren't having a lot of success developing, developing an engine on our own. Um, so yeah, so part of the challenge with that was like, um, so when Interplay started falling apart and then, you know, an opportunity to do Baldur's Gate 3 got canceled and then also uh fallout 3 or slash fallout fallout van buren also got canceled there seemed to be the right time to sort of break away and form a brand new company we're like hey we could just do what you're doing at black isle but we wouldn't have all the interplay baggage dragging us down and that originally seemed like a really good idea um the problem came uh, in a number of respects, and I mean there were there are many good things about it because we actually yeah we kept we kept getting to make RPGs, and it was a healthier environment in some respects, but in other respects it wasn't because uh, there were some hard knocks that we had to learn when we started the the new company Obsidian. One was I don't think it ever really sunk in how much help interplay was still giving us even though they were asking for these tight dead tight deadlines on projects like 
you know, we could, we no longer, when we started Obsidian, we like, we no longer had an audio department. Uh, we didn't have an IT department. Uh, we didn't have access to QA. And also we had probably neglected how much we would sometimes be able to borrow from other projects on Interplay. Like, like if we needed animation resources, like we could borrow three animators you know, for two months from another project. And that was okay with Interplay to see a project get done. Or if we needed more QA resources, like we could find some way to, you know, draft QA folks from other projects. But when starting Obsidian, we had none of that in the internal studio. So um, we were pretty much, a, you know, a bare bone developer operation. And, that, and that's when we really started feeling the pinch of, oh, well now it's becoming apparent how much Interplay was actually helping the pipeline process. Um, the other problem was um, there was a, uh, I don't know if sea change is the right word, but back at Black Isle, often uh, our studio head had the ability to tell other developers what to do. Like, hey, if you're going to make an RPG with us or for us, like, here's your requirements, here's your milestones, and basically I'm in charge. Uh, that flipped on its head 180 degrees when we came to Obsidian. And suddenly, instead of being the one calling the shots, uh, we were the ones who were being told what to do. And adjusting to that new hierarchy was, I, I don't know if it ever got adjusted to, to be honest. It was uh, hard for people to accept. And sometimes that would cause friction with publishers. Uh, it would cause arguments. Um, and often it led to us like not working with the same publisher twice, which caused other problems, which I'll get to the, um, but ultimately like uh, when that, when you have that issue with the publishers and that's combined with the idea that we rarely had leverage because we were kind of living from milestone to milestone um, that caused uh, the publishers to have more leverage over us than I think uh, they otherwise might. Um, I was going to make that point actually was that, why did Obsidian seem to be waiting, you know, project to project? Is that just like, a, I guess, the way it was structured initially? Uh, hello? Hey, Justin, can you ask that again? I'm sorry, I actually yeah. got like 10% this time. <laughs> okay, uh, one second. Okay, there we go. Uh, I, I was saying, um, was Obsidian structured project to project by design, or was that sort of just how it sh shaked out, I guess? Um, no, no, that's a good question. So the um, every project had uh, different requirements. Um, like, so for example, if we would be borrowing an engine from another company or you know using their technology, that would mean that we probably wouldn't need as many core engine programmers to create a project. But then when you have a game like uh, Aliens Crucible, where we're basically building our technology from scratch, then suddenly you would need a lot more programming resources to bring that game about. Um, the, big, the big challenge is that uh, often with, with projects, you sort of have to um, agree to a budget and a number of like resource personnel um like almost at the start when doing the contract with a publisher and if you discover that you need more resources or you're unwilling to downscale the project um you can run into problems because then you suddenly start going over budget um you know the you know the game's taking too long uh and yeah so there, there's challenges there Could Obsidian have been a dream team of development talent? Why did they continually lose more creators and creative people, including yourself? Yeah, um, well, actually, I think uh, Obsidian uh, is a dream team. And uh, and I also think it was uh, in, in both respects. Like, it, there's been a bunch of talented developers who, who still work at Obsidian uh, and also ones that used to work obsidian and have gone elsewhere. But um, sometimes I wonder if, you know, the it, it's just, you know, what if people can see the dream team or not. Because the 
a lot of the developers like that are still at Obsidian, like, uh, you know, who, a number of them uh, uh, are on Outer Worlds and other projects. But like, uh, there's a bunch of unsung heroes there that I think, are, you know, pretty much are a dream team of developers. Like, on you know, on the design front, there's a, an area designer, Jeff Huskus, who I, <laughs> he started out in QA for Coder 2, and he was also a designer um, back at Black Isle. But Without him, I don't think a lot of our projects would have gotten the design work done needed to really to really make them come together. And Jeff is Jeff is one of the unsung heroes. And then when it comes to like outer worlds, like uh, their lead level designer Tyson Christensen is amazing. Um, their lead designer Charlie Staples is great. Um, uh, one of their you know best level designers, Dean E. McMurray, she's she's also great. I guess the dream team is, actually is there. It's just a matter of when they get uh, constrained by uh, upper management or okay. publisher decisions. That that makes sense. I understand that. Um, I want to talk about Star Wars now. Um, in particular, you mentioned Kotor two, and so let me go ahead and give you those questions. Um, so for Kotor two, obviously, this was the second game in the series. This came after Bioware's uh, rendition of Kotor one. And um, you guys got the license because, if I remember correctly, Bioware didn't have the time to work on KOTOR 2. And so Obsidian sort of picked it up because of that or something along the lines of that? Yeah, I, th I think the, um, <laughs> the way it sort of seemed to us was that Bioware was sort of giving us the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's that, you know, but that's not a bad way to go. Like, startups don't get the opportunity to work on Neverwinter Nights 2 and you know knights of the republic too so that was great you know and then you know bioware got a cut of the percentage of that for basically doing nothing and whether we succeeded or failed like that was that was a, that would be a win for them uh so like it was a sad it was a savvy business decision because i think and bioware realized that hey you know it's great to do games in other people's franchises and you know our Development teams love D&D &D and love Star Wars, but it's really time for us to make our own IPs, like with Mass Effect, you know, and Dragon Age. And I think that was the right call. Like they they had the skill set to define their own worlds now, like they didn't need to be doing them for someone else. And um, I don't know how true this was, but I think part of the challenge was... Uh, Lucas Arts gave them a pretty strict timetable for hey if you guys want to do code or two like you have to do it within this period of time and Bioware was like nope they're <laughs> like there is no way we could achieve a level of quality in that time frame so like they're, but they're like but I bet Obsidian will do it <laughs> <laughs> so then like then like uh, Fergus calls and Fergus is like yeah our first project's gonna be like Star Wars and I got silent and I'm like oh god are you kidding me. Um, cause like for this was like the prequel times. So like things were not great in the star Wars universe. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm leaving black Isle to go work on star Wars. God. But then, you know, but the more I dug into star Wars though, um, I, I found more and more things to love about it. Like, Oh, I'm like, wow. Like I remember the movies when I was growing up as a kid and you know, here's the parts that I liked and Oh wow. Empire strikes back is still pretty cool. And like, so it, it, it got my energy levels back up again once I dug into it more. Okay, that's that's funny that you bring that up because that's a good transition to the, like kind of like our first question here, which is um, about Kotor Two itself. Can you talk about how your involvement of that uh, game sort of, I guess, panned out? But more specifically, you you talked about how whenever you encountered uh, Star Wars, or at least the idea of doing a project, you were maybe not so enthusiastic. What ultimately sort of, you know, changed that for you? Was it you realized that you had your own chance to kind of do Star Wars in your own way? Was it kind of that thing was appealing to you? Um, yeah, so first off, I, I still found pillars about the uh, the franchise that I realized that I still loved and still held, um, you know, sort of dear to my heart, uh, whether, you know, it was it was apparent or not. The um, so like, for example, like when I was watching Empire Strikes Back, there's a there's a speech that Yoda gives to Luke about, you know, what the force is. And I'm like, wow, that is a really great way to depict it. Like, it's not like a lot of scientific, de scientific detail and it's not a lot of predestination. Like it's 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 the force is this living connection between beings. And there's different ways to, you know, to harness that energy. But um, it, it felt very, very noble and like. Um, um, I guess the part where Yoda says, you know, we're not, 
not these you know, crude creatures like we're you know we're we're much more than that it was very it was very inspiring i'm like that's a really hopeful way to look at humanity like we're not these crude creatures we're, we're something we can be something more um however uh also when i was doing a lot of research um, i started getting more and more questions about um the franchise and one was like hey well in the prequels the force feels more heavy handed. It feels more like it's got an intention behind it. Like it's not like, you know, um, you know, one of the physics, it's not physics anymore or, or even like living energy. It's, it's something that, you know, in some respects I would interpret almost as malevolent. Like it's, it doesn't have our best interests at heart, in my opinion. Like it's it's willing to let us, you know, all be slaughtered and, you know, quote unquote restore balance to the force, but it doesn't care how many living beings die in the process. I'm like, geez, like that's that's a pretty dark way to look at it. It was even darker because it's kind of anti RPG, because oh wow, well if the force has already predestined everything, you know, what choice do you really have? And then I'm like, uh, that's kind of a dark thought. And I'm like, man, it might be interesting, like for someone who realized this, who didn't, who wanted to free themselves from the force because of that very reason. And then basically all those questions, all those points sort of bled into uh, the primary companion slash antagonist, uh, Kreia and the game. And she became someone to kick around those themes with and a motivation behind her actions. Like, I'm not saying I agree with, you know, her perspective at all. Like, I, I don't. I rarely agree with the villains that I write, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it's shy. I still thought it was an opportunity to ask some interesting questions about the, about the universe. Yeah. I, th I think um, that's an interesting uh, uh, point about it's not necessarily beliefs that you have yourself. Uh, I know you said in the past that the inspiration for Kreia ultimately came from Ravel from uh, Planescape Torment, yep. who also was sort of like a witch character <laughs> of sorts yep. and um, a similar sort of uh, foil perspective, I guess you would say, where like they're directly sort of impacting you as a character and your development. Um, that brings me into sort of the second question here is, what what did you think of Kreia as a character uh, in hindsight, but then also what was your ultimate point with her you think um, from a storytelling perspective in KOTOR 2, and what do you think about her relevance in today's Star Wars? If, if she's relevant at all, you think? Um, so, I guess with, with Kreia, I think, um, I mean, like you said, so part of it was, uh, was sort of like a spinning off of Ravel and uh, Planescape Torrent, mostly because I didn't think Ravel had enough screen time. And if uh, if I were doing another Planescape game, I'd want to have Ravel be a be a part of that. Um, and also uh, with Kreia, I think she's still relevant uh, in the Star Wars universe today, especially with a lot of the questions that um, uh, the principal characters in Last Jedi were raising in the sense of like, well, they feel constrained by these old beliefs. And this is the number of characters in that movie. And Kreia's questioning philosophies about the Jedi and Sith, I think, are very relevant uh, in that context. Also, one other aspect I've noticed that while doing research for uh, Jedi Fallen Order um, and watching uh, Clone Wars and then Rebels, I thought what Rebels started to do that was interesting um, was they were including a lot of other cultures perspectives and use of the force versus just the jedi and sith and because they had those outlying perspectives they were sort of able to shed new life on you know the the direction for the galaxy or the direction of one owns one one's own life that was sort of divorced from the jedi and sith ideals and i thought that was that was a really interesting set of subjects that they were raising and you know in, in almost canon. like druids right almost like a druid yes. yeah yeah, because like the rebels, like they're like there's kept being more and more races that would pop up. Like, hey, wait a minute, like you know, they've been around for a while. They understand the force. They completely disagree with how the Jedi and Sith are using it, and they find it offensive. And I'm like, wow, that's a really interesting take. I was not expecting that. And the storytelling put a really good con context layer on that. And I, I think in that in that context, like introducing characters like Kreia can help support those questioning themes.
Yeah, and that makes me think about um, the point that you mentioned with Luke in particular in the most recent Star Wars movie. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, kind of, I would say, hate about that general topic um, and that general, you know, honestly, just the movie in general has a lot of negativity surrounding it. As a Star Wars uh, fanboy, um, I'm still able to be a little bit objective and know that ultimately I watch the movies for just the big flashy graphics, not really for the great storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> I play the games or I, I read the books for that. Um, but did you, did you like Rogue One? I, I actually did. And I did yeah. particularly because I like that it wasn't about the main heroes. You know, it wasn't about like somebody who had something uh, like the force where, where it's kind of like the Jesus card, you know, where you're the chosen one ultimately. And so you can sort of your, you have plot armor, I guess you would say that, that's my problem with some of these like chosen one storylines is, you know, a character like Ray has plot armor and I don't typically like that <laughs> when I'm watching something um, star Wars related. I like a lot of the other stories, you know, the story is about kind of like, who knows about this random bounty hunter on the corner of, you know, like that's the stories that I'm interested in because uh, there's more nuance introduced into those stories. I, I would agree. And I think, uh, you know, one thing I liked about Rogue One was, uh, you know, the intelligence operators for the rebellion, like the, that was showing like a, like, and then, you know, Forrest Whitaker's character, you're like, geez, like, they, they, you know, Saw's character is pretty dark. And then like the, the, like the rebellion intelligence guys, they make some really rough decisions and you, and you can believe it and it's plausible. And then the way they sort of work that in into, into the motivation for like why the intelligence operatives you know, uh, you know, join, join the final attack. Like then they wove it in the motivation and the end sequence. And I'm like, that was really well done. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I thought rogue one was, uh, was pretty great. I didn't enjoy last Jedi uh, as much, mostly because I thought the, the comedy was too much. Like I like a little bit of comedy, but not like so much at the outset. And then like the plot felt like it was meandering, like, and then maybe it's just, I'm biased, but I also felt like Luke was a scapegoat for uh, causing a situation that I, I didn't find very authentic. Um, so yeah, I, I had a lot of challenges with it. There are a lot of things I did like about it. Um, and I did like, uh, like, like you said, like some of the visual effects I thought were cool. I thought the salt, the salt planet was cool and the creatures there were really neat. And, uh, but yeah, I, I had other challenges with that movie. Yeah. in particular with that movie, um, the biggest problem I had is that, the way that they tried to introduce Luke's character seemed in a in like some sort sort of way to me like it was trying to be at least like shown in the trailers initially shown to be almost like a Kreia. Like we were thinking like, oh, he's going to learn that there's also dark sides to the light side of the force or whatever. Right. And that, that it sort of seemed like it was going to be introducing like more nuance. But then what we got was kind of something that seemed like you said, like it was almost like a plot device. Like they just did yeah. it to like prove something um with other characters yeah, it, in the story it felt, it felt kind of hollow and then like uh, so another problem i have is uh, like i, I and like uh, ray and kylo teaming up even though i don't really like kylo ren he's well anyway i'm moving on the the the, the, the big challenge for me was like, i still don't know who snoke is and i'm like what like this guy is supposedly like drive the driving force in these first two new movies and i like there's nothing about him and now he's dead maybe i like and then i'm like why like, why did you do this? Because like, that makes no sense. Uh. Would you say it's safe to say that you're of the belief as a designer that you have to introduce the uh, antagonist early on and create a relationship with that character versus like just revealing them at the very end? Because I, I feel like that's what it made me think of when I saw it myself. It was like Snoke. Oh, yeah. he's the big bad guy. And it's just like, I don't have enough time to formulate thoughts about who this guy even is yet. Yeah, you know, there's the, I think both techniques for introducing the beginning and the end can work. I prefer the beginning as early as possible, if, if only to see a visual of the bad guy or to hear their voice or something where you can sort of like put an anchor on him and go, oh, that is the, that is the big antagonist right now. Like that could change over time. But I think once you understand the opposition, uh, where usually most of the drama is coming from and, you know, in movies or games or whatever, I think that makes the arc just stronger because, you know, that they were there at the outset, like, and, and you, and the more you get exposed to them, 
you know, the greater the chances of, you know, your triumph over that individual being all the stronger versus, oh, well, I, you know, I only have the bad guy in the last three minutes. Uh, yeah. And then you have, you have a danger of undercutting the drama or not, or making the success not that, um, not that impactful. Um, I guess uh, I forgot something I was going to mention earlier about uh, Kreia in particular. Was was your idea of her as a character mainly because you wanted her to serve as a foil for the main character? Was that sort of your idea that she would help you um, kind of being this character who was essentially created? You don't really know your backstory necessarily. And what you do know is like only bits and pieces. Was that sort of like your ultimate design with Kreia was to serve as the foil as well as obviously end up being a villain of sorts? Well, maybe I've had just a bunch of bad teachers. Well, I mean, not bad, but like <laughs> teachers that no matter if the student is doing a good job or a bad job, like they continually challenge them. And for, and for me, it always felt like the best mentors would never let up. Um, and I felt Kreia should do that, mostly because if the player is playing like light side or dark side, they still need to have that mentor figure and that mentor figure should still be challenging them. Uh, also, that's a lot of uh, Kreia's viewpoint on the player character because, you know, she's trying to test to figure out like why you made the decisions you did because I, I think there's, there's two aspects to it. One is I'm not sure if I, I, I'm not sure like she realizes how the player got there and she needs more information. The other thing is, uh she also cares very much for the player character not just because they made the choice they did but because of you know who the character is intrinsically as a person and i think um it shows a lot of respect for the player and the player character when you know the ultimate bad guy of any game does genuinely care about you like that's that's a pretty strong like wow like this this person could be doing a lot of damage in the universe but they they focused on me and they like they and they they have some some personal connection and then thus making her as a companion in that game was was a lot of the point of that where you could get a chance to talk with her you know see what her background was learn the learn the events that shaped her to, you know, the, the, the current state she is at the start of the game, and then also realize, uh, you know, what her final incarnation is at the end of the game. Okay, uh, that that's just a crazy way to lead into the story that I mentioned previously, and um, I hope you can get the majority of this. <laughs> Sorry, uh, if it's only going to come in in bits and pieces, but... Um... So when I was a young kid, I guess I was 13, was the first time that I had played KOTOR 2. And here's the funny thing, I actually played the second game before the first game. Because I, I didn't know that there was a first game before that. So <laughs> I played the second game first thinking this was the first one. So when people talked about characters in the past, I liked that in that game, you guys didn't spoil anything too much about the first game really. You kind of made it a lot of like, eh, maybe you get bits of information every now and then when you ask about it, but generally speaking, it was kind of shrouded. And so I didn't get really anything spoiled for me. But anyway, so KOTOR 2 for me, Kreia specifically, and it's weird to say this, and I'm sure you get things like this, and it probably, because I, I get things like this sometimes on YouTube, and I wonder if you do as well, and particularly, or sorry, particularly because of your characters that you create, or maybe like a game that you worked on. And for me, Kreia was like... um the first time as a young kid that I had realized that maybe not everything was so cut and dry. <laughs> I, I grew up in, you know, an environment where it was like I was pretty poor. And so I saw things one way, you know, it was just this one way. And that was just how things were. But with that character, when she kept asking me throughout the game, my character the, uh, in the game, sorry, not even me, right? She was really asking me in real life. And I was thinking to myself, like, huh, I never examined maybe that this is not a bad thing. Maybe if you look at it in this light, it could be a good thing. So it's it's weird to say, but I can personally say, and I do say it often, that KOTOR 2 was a big uh, proponent in me kind of having a big philosophy change. Now, I'm not going to say that I'm <laughs> trying to destroy the galaxy of all life in the Force, <laughs> but um, I certainly learned something, I think, useful and important from her as a character. So it, I just want to thank you for Kreia as a character, period. But also, that was a great game. And thank you to the whole team involved with it. Well, that, that, that's really great. Well, thanks for that, Justin. That's very 
You know, part of it, I, I have to, I have to owe the, uh, the gratitude to just the nature of role playing games because it always struck me that if you're doing, if you're game mastering a game, um, whether it's digital or pen and paper, like it, it's okay to introduce a theme or raise questions, but you, you, you should be doing it in exactly the respect that you, that you were describing, where it causes the player to think about it. And then they may then they decide for themselves, like, well, what 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 matters to me as a player, and what do I think is the right or wrong thing to do in a in a certain situation? And suddenly, you learn something about yourself, where you're like, hey, well, if I wasn't faced with this moral dilemma or this situation, like, I never would have asked myself that question. I think, you know, one game I think this does great with this is, uh, you know, the Witcher series, like, where it's it's never quite clear and. I think there's strengths to this where you're never quite sure what the repercussions of your actions are. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll be forced to make a decision where you're like, I don't have information, but based on what I have, you know, what do I think is the right thing or the appropriate thing for me to do philosophically as, as a player? Like what, like how do I think this situation should be resolved based on everything that I've learned in my own personal experience? And I think that makes even the simplest side quest in which you're like, fascinating because you're you you're asking yourself questions as much as you're asking other people questions yeah it's interesting that you bring up um the witcher because uh the witcher 2 is actually my favorite game in the series and it's my favorite specifically because of the narrative i think is especially strong in the end um whenever you have to make it i'm not going to spoil anything but you have to make a number of choices and as you said that was the first time in a game that i legitimately had to pause and then just start thinking crap which one am I going to choose? Like, I don't even know which one to choose. It wasn't so clear to me. Like in other games, it can be sometimes very clear. Either punch the guy in the face and steal his wife or or give him a nice, you know, hot chocolate fudge or, or something like that. It's like, it's so cut and dry. It's like, well, uh, do I want ice cream or do I want to just like assault somebody? You know, it's it's more cut and dry. But um, in, in The Witcher 2, a lot of the decisions... You don't even know basically what the repercussions could have been. My only problem it, uh, with the third game is that basically they never addressed any of the decisions that happened in the end of the second game. So that kind of annoyed me. But obviously everybody sees Witcher 3 as a mega success anyway. So I doubt anybody cares about my really specific critique. <laughs> well, um, you know, so, so I think the the worst thing a uh a role-playing game can do and this is really strange because fallout like is actually actually does this system and i i think and there were also challenges the star wars you know uh, interaction systems we'll start, i'll start with fallout the i i haven't always liked the idea of how speech checks or skill checks are used in dialogue because uh, i like the idea like when I when I first saw it in Fallout One, I thought amazing. I was like, oh wow! Like, it, and it definitely affected my design work from then on. Like Fallout One was like eye opening. I'm like, oh my god, you can get so much more nuances in dialogue, because it's checking what your character knows and you know their abilities, et cetera. And, but the the problem is that uh, speech checks at some point just became an instant win for dialogue. So much so that. I don't know if people started like evaluating the consequences of each response versus, oh, there's a space check. Uh, I can make it. That's going to give me the best option. And you're not thinking about it anymore because the game is sort of like pushed you in that direction. I think speech checks work best from a role playing standpoint when speech gives you more information about the person you're talking to but it doesn't really limit the range of how you want to interact with that character or if you want to provoke that character into doing something like i think one good dialogue uh attribute they had in fallout one was empathy where like you could sense whether a response you were going to give was going to make someone happy or angry but that didn't mean it was the best response it would just tell you like the, like what the what the emotional reaction was going to be so for example like you might want to anger somebody and that might be the success for you in which case empathy would help you know how to provoke that person which i think is infinitely more interesting than hey you have a 76 percent speech which means here's the choice you should make to get this particular like talky quest solution and uh, i think that ends up being a problem we have that same problem in star wars too where 
part of the time and, and mostly because also the light side dark side was tied into the game mechanics people would just choose dark side and light side options just to get to a certain jedi or sith level and i'm like well are you really role playing at that point or is it more just a binary choice versus you're actually making moral decisions well that's it's funny you mentioned that because uh the, the i have two pretty big critiques of kotor 2 and of course hindsight's 2020 it's been you know 10 12 years since i've been playing the game um so uh, i've had a little bit of time to think about it and i know you've already thought about it because it's that obvious but the thing that always drove me crazy about Kreia and the implementation of the alignment system in the game was that even though she was telling me these lessons, I could never actually listen to her. Like <laughs> I couldn't just be like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> and just listen to her. It was She was always going to be against me. And that was just because, of course, I know the game was designed that way. She had to be pushing back at me, right? Whether I was light or dark. But that was always a thing that when I was young, I wished that I could have had a playthrough where I actually listened to what she said and see, and see what happens. <laughs> oh, cool. That's very flattering. <laughs> oh, <wow. Whew. laughs> yeah, that was one of that was that was one of them. And then the other one was um, when, when it comes to, I guess, the way uh, alignment works with some of the major plot points in the game. What always struck me as weird is that I didn't want to necessarily be happy to the Jedi Council whenever I met them individually. So I had a weird like pseudo dark side light side playthrough where I would kill all of the Jedi or I would bring them all to the temple and then kill them all at the very end. <laughs> like so cuz I, I was I don't know why like I I just thought of like maybe that seems more light side in a way because I'm like hey, I need to get rid of you guys because you're just not good Jedi anymore. <laughs> But I couldn't think of another way to do it because I didn't want to just befriend them. And plus, I knew, obviously, spoilers, Kreia kills them anyway. <laughs> yep. Uh, anyway, I had, I had to get that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Before we finish uh, the KOTOR topic, um, obviously, there's been some recent news about the whole Disney overlords taking over. And um, there's been rumors, of course, about a possible KOTOR movie possibly a tv series and i know even if you could talk about it or sorry even if you were involved you wouldn't talk about it so instead i'll ask you what oh, is your uh, opinion of how the direction of such a thing would go um well i can't talk too much about it but the uh from my personal standpoint um so my thoughts in the older public was i felt like uh it was a great way to sort of reset the basic principles of the Star Wars universe. I think Bioware made the right call to to sort of like, you know, turn the clock back and go, hey, we're just going to do this section of a timeline where we can introduce all the Star Wars elements that really made Star Wars for us. And um, I think that worked really well. And that said, I think I'm sort of divided on how much Revan should be used in such a universe because I feel like... Uh, Revan, to an extent, is partly a game construct and is something personal to the player. So that if a series gave him too much, him or her too much attention, that might detract from your own experiences from having played the game because he ends up, he or she ends up not being your character anymore. Uh, and I, and that and part of that informs okay coder, coder two or like well we don't want to go too much into detail with Revan. We just want to make sure you know how important you as a character were and still are, so we can set you up for third game. Even really happen. So for me, I, I guess uh, kind of up in the air, but um, those are just some of my thoughts on it. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand that. And um, the last, I, I forgot, one last sneak question in, about KOTOR. <laughs> Um, there's a good uh, bit of speculation, and I know I think you m might have addressed it once before, but I forgot if you were definitive. And since it's obviously not canon anymore, it doesn't ultimately matter, uh, this particular story. But there's this, you know, old-fashioned, I should say, conspiracy theory concerning Usanis, uh, the Achani general, and then Kreia, or Kreia's original character, "Quote unquote original character who was supposed to uh, also be a Chani, uh, <laughs> and Revan ends up killing uh, Usanis, and so the idea was that uh, Kreia never held it against him because she respected him or whatever else. And so this was like a weird. Have you ever heard this conspiracy theory before? Uh, I caught half of what you said, but does it relate to Kreia's real name? 
If not, that's okay. Yes. And, and... Uh, I, 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 I cannot and will not answer that. <laughs> I, I have absolutely heard that theory. And uh, yes. Okay. All right. That is all, that is all I will say. Fair enough. Uh, to, to change gears a little bit, you said something about how the way RPGs uh, handle, I guess, skill checks in game in, in regards to conversations. You worked uh, as a writer on Pathfinder Kingmaker, but what did you think of their process? I typed it out. I don't. Are you still oh, okay. there? Oh, uh, yeah. So the um, for those. Uh, well, for me, the skill checks and and Pathfinder. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be kind of an odd comment. So I, 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 I how do I put this? Um, most of my challenge with skill checks and Pathfinder. Uh, I'm sorry, in Kingmaker, the digital, the digital version, was that sometimes I would lose my temper at locked doors. And I would unnecessarily blame certain companions for just simply not being good enough <laughs> because they would randomly fail or unlock a door. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> How dare you, Lindsay? Uh, and then uh, so for me, that was the, I think that may have eclipsed my other thoughts about any other skill checks in the game. But I did think that was a that was a faithful interpretation of the rules. And I think. It, it, it's interesting because the there are people like when working on D and D games or certain franchises who have some knowledge of the franchise. I think Owl Cat was the first experience I had where the project director felt like he knew every single thing <laughs> about uh, the Pathfinder system. Like he was like a walking encyclopedia. Uh, wow. His name's Alexander Michelin. He uh, he we could ask him anything and he could give us like you know the, the book it showed up in the uh, the consequences of it the errata to that that system like all sorts of stuff was just amazing i'd love to meet him so i could ask him why they made uh spiders uh, so a... damn hard to kill <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's uh he is the nicest guy and uh you can talk about all sorts of nerdy stuff with him in the best possible way yeah he's super cool okay uh to change gears again you talked a bit about fallout but we didn't really dive too much into it can you compare working on Fallout 2 to your experience working on Fallout 3 in New Vegas? So uh, New Vegas had a lot of echoes of Fallout 2 material, partly because it was on the West Coast and partly because uh, some of the same developers were working on it, uh, me included, even though that gives away my age. Uh, and also we took some stuff from uh, the scrapped Fallout Van Buren back at Interplay, and then we re reintegrated those into New Vegas. Uh, so there were some design uh, elements that we carried over. Uh, so there was a similarity there. But in terms of the process of actually building the game, um, aside from the open world aspects, which we didn't have a lot of experience with previously, uh, a lot of the same design templates we'd use back at Black Isle for like Fallout 2 games and, you know, writing style guides. And here's how we set up an area design template. And here's how we do maps. Like that was pretty much still the same sort of stuff. The, we did, we did refine it um, over the course of New Vegas. Cause one thing that we were missing on New Vegas was the hierarchy could sometimes get uh, clouded because uh, like we knew who the lead writer was and we knew who the project director was, but when it came to possibly the most important design aspect of the game, which was, hey, how do we uh, lead all the level designers? We didn't have a lead level designer for quite some time, and I think that caused a lot of optimization issues and lag and uh, a lot of bugs that we had to fix after release just because the the memory kept crapping out on uh, especially on the PS3 version, and that was because we just didn't have a set of uh, a guidelines to follow for constructing certain, certain environments. Um, we did try and improve that as we did more and more Fallout-related work. So when we started doing the DLCs, we actually set up a much more regimented process for how we would contain con constrain the content while still allowing, you know, you making sure that each character had a chance to shine, but here's the new weapons we're going to do. 
uh, here's the, you know, here's how each skill set's going to get like something, you know, special to them. Here's, here's how each character archetype's going to get something. And we run it by all the leads first before just doing it. And like, hey, do, do you guys see any problems with this? Like, do you see any problems with, you know, X number of weapons or X number of armor sets? Or do you not feel confident about the monster selection or the, or the bestiary? Like, do you understand the story? Is it something that you... Uh, think can work or if you don't think it can work and why and then once we hashed out all the leads uh, they were able to tell their people like hey well here's the reason we made these decisions um, I'm in favor of it for the reasons and it, it's, not, it's not like it couldn't be changed later but getting all that buy-in from the leads from the outset helped a lot and then also we did uh, story presentations for each DLC where we tried to show every member of the development team once production started exactly what the character arc was going to be like who the main characters were like what the environments and how they tied together and the hope with that was hey now that you guys understand the big picture and the things we're trying to do with each of the stories in the dlc hopefully that'll inform like how you lay out areas like uh, how you do prop placement like and how you how you sort of help help sell the storyline for the game and uh, I think that helped a lot, and also it was kind of necessary uh, time crunch for the DLCs to to get them out. So it, streamlining that process and focusing on what was important became uh, more regimented during that. Now it's obviously been some time since Fallout New Vegas came out. You know, it's been nine years or so, and so it's been a while since we've seen a more, I would say, darker take on the Fallout world. Fallout 4 came out and uh, I, what was it now? And I, I have to look that up myself. I can't even remember. 2015? 16? 2015. Fallout 4 came out in 2015, but uh, obviously that has a number of issues and I'll, I'm not going to ask you to outline any of those or even necessarily comment on those. But my, my main point is that it's obviously been said all over the place. I'm sure you've gotten many tweets, people asking for a more you know, Fallout New Vegas or Fallout 2, uh, 2 style of Fallout game instead of doing the Elder Scrolls Fallout. <laughs> um, so my question really in regards to that is, do you think current Fallout, Fallout 4 in particular, I guess you would say, is still Fallout? You know, Fallout 76 also came out. Maybe that kind of tinted or tainted things a little bit. Do you think it's the same kind of game that it was originally or do you think it's kind of becoming something else now? Um, so I don't think it's, it's, it's the same. It still has some of the touchstones of what makes Fallout Fallout, but I think, um, some of the game mechanic changes have, uh, have made it feel less of an RPG to me. Um, and, and again, like, but then you can do the counter argument where, you know, the, the latest generation of gamers are like, well, you know, you're, you're an old PC guy and you're used to all this fiddling around with you know stats and you know upping your upping your skills but you know that was the kind of stuff that i enjoyed doing um i was happy to see in fallout 4 that there was much more emphasis on uh companions and then there were more factions introduced um i uh i i didn't play a lot of fallout 4 um and i didn't play fallout 76 but i think one thing that became apparent was I think a lot of the backlash on Fallout 76 was because no matter how much Bethesda tried to explain to people in advance that, hey, you're not going to meet NPCs in the environment, uh, people still expected it. Like, and people still didn't get that message because they themselves considered that so intrinsic to the franchise. They're like, yeah, but that's part of what makes Fallout Fallout is the people you interact with. And it's not just other players it's the interesting people you meet in the environment. And then they, and they try to do different ways of doing that. But I think without those NPCs, it actually took away something that people were expecting. And I think that makes, is a big part of what makes Fallout Fallout. Would you say then, um, I guess by that point, that Fallout of current age is sort of in trouble? I mean, are we going to see anything close to the previous quality of games? At this point, I mean, it's I, of course it's hard to say, but it just seems like they're trending in a different direction with it. No, I don't think it's in trouble. I think it's uh, it, it, 
I think Bethesda has more than enough resources to continue to support Fallout as well as there being a strong internal team that believes very much in Fallout and sort of still wants to tell stories in that universe. And I, and I, I, so I, I don't think Fallout per se, like it'll still be around and, and more Fallout games will come out. For me, uh, I have to confess when I first heard about Fallout 76, uh, for me, it felt like from a game developer standpoint and a publisher standpoint, that was the next logical step to start experimenting with when it came to Fallout because at some point they have to start investigating multiplayer. Like ideally you would do that in a way that doesn't disrupt the RPG experience. And I think there's absolutely ways to do that. But I think in Fallout 76 was a test bed for them going, okay, well, how how could we start introducing multiplayer elements into Fallout? And why don't we use Fallout 76 as an experiment to learn how to do that? And even though it had, uh, you know, its challenges and its speed bumps and the reception, you know, wasn't what they hoped for, I don't think they could have not done that in some respect. Like it was just a natural transition for for them to start looking into because, you know, it's, I, I love single player games. Uh, but at some point you do have to investigate, well, is multiplayer actually feasible? And, you know, how do we make that? I think Fallout was something that Bethesda always wanted to bring to the multiplayer or online space. I think that's probably why I'm so critical of it is that, you know, in particular, MMOs are my favorite type of genre, period. So MMORPGs are my ultra favorite genre because it's like you're combining the RPG aspects of the single player games that I love, but you're also making it on a massive scale. So... I mean, I, I sort of agree with the idea that eventually you do want to go to being uh, online. I think the reason why I have a big problem with Fallout 76 is because I know it's an obvious, uh, it's an obvious blunder, if that makes sense. And I, it's an obvious blunder in the sense that they knew that it wasn't going to be perfect. They knew that it wasn't necessarily going to blow the doors off. But they also, as I think you alluded to, knew that it was the next step in their journey if they wanted to at least... A flirt with the possibility of having a multiplayer game or more specifically in my eyes a co-op game or something of the sort of that so i mean i see it for what it is and that's in that respect um maybe behind uh closed doors but i guess for the consumers is more so where i think more of my ire is drawn from i guess i would say yeah um so i i i rarely have ever had any control for when a game is released and ever if it was up to me i'd always be willing to um sacrifice money and time as long as it didn't hurt other developers like i would take out loans like i would do whatever it takes be just because like if you spend like two or three of years of your life on a project but then everyone give like manage management gives up in the last two or three months and like yeah just fuck it ship it uh it, it it makes all those years <laughs> it does so much damage you're just like soul in this game and now like you guys were adver advocating for quality like right there along with me but now that it's inconvenient for you like you are willing to release something subpar because it's too difficult for you to do it and i think that's what marks the dividing line between um a businessman like a, a true developer like a developer you know has, has their heart in that project and they and they want to see it you know brought to a quality standard and, I, and so for me fallout 76 in mind experimented with it and i did like that they were admitting their mistakes as they were going along because that's a very anti-bethesda thing to do but seeing them say before release we have these challenges and issues and we know there's going to be some However, I do think they should have taken more time with that because quite clearly some of those issues were present upon release. And I, I, no player should have to pay for a, a buggy title. And I've had to work on a lot of games that are released with, you know, tons of bugs, like whether, you know, it's, uh, you know, Colors of 21 or New Vegas or, uh, you know, any, any of the titles that, you know, we worked on Obsidian, there was, they would just get rushed towards the end because money would run out. People's patience would run out. Um, you know, publisher and management conflicts would, you know, exacerbate that problem. But for me, it's just like your reputation gets built on these, on, on these projects that you release. And 
even if it seems like you're going to suffer some financial loss in the short term by by taking the time to do a good job like i think the long term benefits like prove it out like i think you know bioware like you know they were committed to doing that like and, and they did and they did sacrifice to get it done back when like ray or greg was there like they those two doctors like they their company was theirs like they had their heart and soul in it, and they're like hey we're just going to do a good job we're going to do whatever it takes to get this game out and have it be good you can have your timetables and you can have your demands but we are going to do a good job no matter no matter what you say and uh to not see that and be on the other side of that especially with people who aren't attached or won't have any accountability to what happens it's just it's just sad to see like you know they they might be counting their temporary bucks like oh wow you know at least we at least we got our money like I, i'm like well that that's not going to last very long and you know it's we're it's not going to help us prevent the same sort of situation from happening again and again it's beyond frustrating yeah um you know i don't want to uh bring up a certain company but i think that's sort of where it's trending towards with the whole ha handling of um bioware and electronic arts like it's it's been something that i've been watching unfold since you know very much the beginning because you know i being a big mmo fan i was playing and, and internally testing SWOTOR way back when. And so I also followed that game, I think, four or five years before it even launched. So I was following it for some time, very aware of the whole transition from Bioware becoming, you know, EA Bioware back to, you know, they changed their name so many different times. But point being that now you're seeing with the back-to-back -back launch of Mass Effect Andromeda and then also this recent Anthem, one of the biggest things that I've been kind of, uh, I guess, fearful of with this is that I fear that EA is willing maybe to have the games pushed out, but I'm very much afraid that the tarn or sorry, the reputation is going to be tarnished in, in Bioware, and that ultimately is just going to lead to them being shut down because they're not going to be able to make money anymore. And I'm kind of worried about that. Yeah, I think uh, there's there's a number of things there. I think uh, the the lack the the way the management process is working, I think, is going to cause a lot more reservations uh, from Bioware and people looking to move on. I think EA will always keep Bioware as a name, but as to whether it's still the same Bioware that perhaps you and I remember is, is, is has been proving itself to not be the case. And uh, when you read the article about you know the stages the projects went through like it's uh you know there's the technology mandates which i will completely agree cause a ton of problems like it, like no one engine is going to solve every every single game's content uh challenges like and to see that is uh that, that i was surprised at that um and then like really sad and then also it also sounded like from the art i don't this was the case because I, you know, obviously wasn't wasn't there. Um, but to see the amount of indecision among certain levels and or, hey, let's, you know, leave decision to a committee or, you know, have we ever decided upon this feature? Like, are we committed to it? And then, and then seeing all the question marks versus decisions being made, that in itself is a huge development red flag. Like, it, it didn't even sound like, you know, a creative visionary changing their mind. It just sounded like they couldn't come to a decision. And that that's definitely the death of a project right there because the, no one's focused on the right priorities for getting it done. It does considerable damage as has been shown. The other thing is um, I also think that as much as technology has helped us distribute games nowadays, like whether, you know, uh, through, through through Steam or whatever. The um, I think sometimes uh, publishers will fall. Publishers, even developers, um, which is even sadder, is they'll fall back on the oh well because it's easy to patch now. We consider this more of a living project, and therefore, like even if it comes out of the gate, you know, not good. Like we'll probably fix it in a few months or mods will fix it or whatever it happens to be like, you know, and that was the case with like, you know, new Vegas or, you know, well, we will be able to patch this so we can fix all these problems later. And I'm like, well, that's not really going to help anyone playing it <laughs> upon release. And we're probably waiting for it. Uh, I mean, over time, those things can get addressed, but uh, it's just, a, but the fact that that option is there sometimes that, 
the, I'll see people like they'll they'll use that as a safety net for oh well it's not going to be that bad because we can fix it later and I I completely disagree with that philosophy I'm like there are people who are waiting for this game on day one and it is our responsibility to make sure that project you know shines and they have a good experience from it with a minimum of bugs and it's hard to kill every bug but there's <laughs> Sometimes games come out and there's no way they could these bugs were in the game. Like they're just, they're just too many. So anyway, that's, that's my thought on that. No, I, I understand that. And actually I wanted to provide like, I guess a bit of a theory on the, you mentioned that, you know, maybe kind of sort of talking about Anthem, but maybe Andromeda as well, Mass Effect Andromeda as well, but a creative sort of not taking the lead of anything. And my, my theory on that was sort of, and and bear with me here because this is a theory but it's like all right so let's say you're working for bioware and you hear all of this stuff happening with andromeda they're losing writers because they said that you know this person's working on the project he actually isn't where i think it they actually said drew Kerpetian was working on the project he wasn't <laughs> he didn't work on the project they had these other designers that were supposed to lead and then all of a sudden i think at some point people started to look at the project and were like you know what I'm not going to be the creative lead here because this thing is probably going to fail and it's going to be my name on the line. I, I kind of had that theory about it, and, and, you know, reading all the different stories, I guess. Uh, just, could you repeat that again? I, again, like, a... no, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, I was saying that um, I had a theory in, uh, in particular about Anthem that creative leads uh, didn't take you know, control of the project because none of them wanted to take the uh, fall. <laughs> they... oh, that's, yeah. Uh, that, that, you know, that could be, uh, I, I know, I know uh, they most likely drove some people away because the people that left were, were people who were willing to make a call. On and then they're like, well, we want, this is the decision, but now, but now you guys are introducing 10 other people in this process and then like voting on it. And it's really hard to maintain vision for any particular part of a project from game systems to writing to level design when you end up diluting it and watering it down by committee. Like it just, it doesn't end up the same experience. And then also you rob the lead of that power where you're like, I appointed you to be a lead so you carry the torch for this part of the project. And if you're continually going to be throwing water on the torch, like it's eventually going to sputter out and, you know, be useless. That makes sense. And to go back to something you mentioned earlier about uh, RPGs and kind of a push towards uh, online, um, one of the questions that I had for you was, what's your opinion of MMOs? And I guess in particular, I should ask, have you ever played one? Is there one in particular that you played, if you did, that you enjoyed, etc.? I've never really heard your opinion about MMORPGs really at all. Um, I actually enjoy them. I, I played like probably like most people I played. I had a stunt playing World of Warcraft for a long period of time um, to the detriment of my health. <laughs> I'm not sure, sure of many other people. Um, but yeah, I enjoy playing them. Uh, I did try to transition to other. Uh, I tried to play, uh, I think it was the Secret World. Um, damn it, it's one of the. It, it's anyway, there, there was the one MMO that had the. Uh, more of a urban fantasy type feel about it and that one i was really excited about but there's too many bugs to play it the secret world uh, yeah that was fun com ragnar turnquist of uh of uh the longest journey yeah yeah exactly and then like i love the setup for that world i'm like oh, the, you know the powers are cool the factions sound pretty cool i want to jump into it and then i couldn't like i there was a bug that prevented me from getting, getting past the tutorial sequence i'm like no <laughs> so, but yeah i enjoy playing them i think there's rooms for narrative storytelling in those types of games that still make you feel special but still allow you to join together as a group and um i've never really had any negativity about mmos at all i think they're they're a lot of fun and it's really cool to team up with your friends the only problem I've ever seen is uh, when it becomes work. And I've seen, you know, the, you know, looking in on Guild where, like, you know, they have their raid schedule. And, like, if you're the rogue, like, you have to be online during periods of time and you have to be there for this. Or if you're the healer, like, you know, you're even more in demand because there's a support personnel for other players. And, like, it becomes like a second job. And you're like, I'm like, I don't know if I would enjoy 
<laughs> being a part of that. And uh, I've also seen people running guild and they don't seem to be having a lot of fun. <laughs> so that there, there is that dark, you know, grindy aspect where suddenly like, you know, the desire to get, you know, a, a certain colored item with a few more points added to it becomes the obsession of your life to the point where it's robbing you of the fun of playing the game. Yeah, it's a careful balance of like, you can't make the game 100% fun, which is kind of what I think the problem is with current MMOs, is that they play just like games and they don't play like worlds. And the question that I had, um, I just posted to you was, do you think that MMOs sort of trending away from being virtual worlds where they were trying to sort of be an RPG-like world in itself that was self-contained, do you think that this has hurt them immersion-wise or maybe even success-wise? Because to add a little bit more context to the question... In current day and age, we're seeing uh, MMOs focus a lot more on just getting you into activities instantly, which is kind of not really what the original intention was coming from, you know, pen and paper to MUDs to 3D uh, uh, games as well. It sort of was about being an actual world, you know, like virtual world is the uh, the word and term used over and over again by people like Richard Garriott and uh, Brad McQuaid, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that MMOs trending away from virtual worlds, like hurt them in any way if I, I know this it might seem a little bit esoteric but i'm sure you know a lot about creating worlds do you mean uh more uh um mmos that are more like you know like game like uh, i guess i would say like, more... you mean like 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 rust and um or like rust or arc or do you mean i would say closed circuit like theme park is the word that i think primarily oh wait, what was the word <clears throat> theme park uh, justin what was the word uh theme park Oh, okay. Um, has it hurt them? Um, well, that that's a uh, that's a that's a difficult debate because on one on one hand, you could argue that getting people into the game gameplay loop faster is better for players, and sometimes if a, if an on ramp experience narratively is not well designed, it actually um, can diminish your enjoyment or even like prevent you from. Uh, even getting into the game. I, I I will say that, you know, when I was playing World of Warcraft, I felt like I was being introduced to both the gameplay loop and also the perspective of each culture in that game with the quests they had. And and it was and just by the nature of the quests I was having, I was learning more about the world. Here's our adversaries. I understand what the big problem is. Uh, you know, and I I I felt like there was that was a good a good medium. Like there's probably more like narrative mechanics you could add to that, but I still felt like I knew my place in the world. Um and even more importantly, I think what was interesting about World of War, I still cite this as an example about how to do quote unquote evil factions to this day. They did a pretty good job of outlining the nobility of each of the evil factions. Like there was something to be proud of in each of those factions, whether it was like, hey, the Forsaken, like they're trying to like, just, you know, maintain their free will against the other undead and being enslaved. And then like, you know, the Tauren, like they're, you know, they just they're they're one with the land and they've just recognized the alliance are stomping all over that. And orcs orcs are proud war. Like all that stuff is like you're not evil per se there are there are positive things about your culture that are something you can embrace heroically whether you're horde or alliance and i thought that was a really good aesthetic that they added to that that i think would have benefited our own faction design for example on new vegas where you know we had you know at least one faction that was completely in my opinion, unsympathetic, where like it's well, you know, they're they're ruthless pragmatists, but I I think it's a hard sell to make anyone want to join this faction because they they tip the line of being something you'd want to fight for versus something you want to fight against, and and in a game that and in a game where you want people to explore different factions and sort of like weigh the consequences of joining each one, ideally you want the player to be tempted to join each faction, and I think. You know, while World of Warcraft did it well, I think that there have been games I've worked on where it hasn't worked out design-wise very well. I actually, I, I agree. I've actually been playing on a old-school private server um, where you play a WoW Vanilla or WoW Classic, so the oh, vanilla cool. launch of the game. So I, I've been kind of going through it myself because 
something about playing old school games is still more appealing to me than playing the newer school ones. But I think that's because um, this kind of goes into my next question, really. Do you think that in some ways the current limitations, whether tech or not, uh, and MMOs kind of inhibit them from being more compelling than like a single player RPG? And like to provide like a small example, when I went to that tabletop uh, festival, Pax Unplug, that I mentioned to you earlier, um, I, when I asked a guy uh, who played uh, pen and paper RPGs why he didn't play MMOs, he just simply said to me, there's not enough freedom yet. I can't do enough in the, in the game. I can oh, do way fine. more. Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I think uh, I'd probably add resource limitations to that. Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that, even though this is an example, um, it, it's a, the start, like doing the Old Republic MMO, I thought was interesting and in that they were going to sort of introduce the, um, the coder one heavy dialogue formula, uh, in, into the game and everything was going to be voice and there would be these, you know, these character arcs. Um, but I think what was interesting was like the amount of resources that took was considerable um, uh, and, and definitely impacted some design choices for the game. Also, it makes it harder to add new content because you've already sort of front loaded the player's expectations for what new content's going to be. Uh, also, anything involving voice acting is not as flexible as other systems. Like it's easy to it's easy to edit text, but not so much, you know, a voice actor across X different languages to to um, to do a new recording, and then that can get really expensive. Also, I think it it comes down to how you're designing the game. Because the thing I found interesting with Old Republic was when it came out, all the developers I was working with uh, either just played one story path and stopped. Or they'd play a story path and they'd start another one until they'd done like six, and then they'd stop playing because there was nothing beyond that 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 compelled them to keep playing. And um, I thought that was interesting. I'm like, oh well, they they embraced the Knights Old Republic slash Mass Effect, you know, Mass Effect experience, but they weren't willing to go farther than that because the other the rest of the design of the game wasn't wasn't keeping pace with the story elements so when the story elements were sort of gone or diminished like there wasn't enough meat there to keep you going or you or maybe you were just there for the story which is what you know bioware was known for and is known for. um so yeah i don't know if that answers your question yeah no uh, i was actually going to add that eight different story class lines uh you know st i should say eight class storylines are kind of like it's hard not to get into a situation where one is inevitably going to be better than the other and there's two in particular uh, i should say three in particular that stand out in that game and i played through all of them <laughs> so there's a uh, star wars or sorry there's the sith warrior there is the uh jedi knight which is obviously a focus because of luke sith warrior yes. is a focus because of vader and then the imperial agent i'm not really sure why that one ended up being so good but it did and um those in particular are That's the cool. ones that everybody talks about i believe the writer for that was chris latoy let me look it up really quick sorry about this uh no problem yeah it was the, it was sorry it was the imperial agent yeah imperial agent okay, hold on one second sorry about this because i the only reason i asked Worlds, which I think would be another huge plus for the game. Um, Imperial Agents, writer. Oh my God, no! Oh my God, browser sucks. All right, hold on. Agent writer. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, Alexander Freed. Yeah, he. Uh, I'm sorry, he actually isn't working on Outer. Uh, he is over. Uh, oh, where is he now? I think. I don't know if I can even say. <laughs> yeah, I talked to him last year. I should probably get back in touch with him. This is a good reminder. Uh, but yeah, like uh, everything that I heard on the Imperial was a was a very strong storyline. So you, you can thank you can thank Alex. <laughs> I will, uh, especially if I get the chance. <laughs> I'll thank him personally. Um, to move to more sort of general gaming questions, which means we're reaching kind of like the end of the uh, podcast. <laughs> I, I want to thank you so far for <laughs> sticking with us and answering all of our questions because I know there's been a lot. Um, the question that I had, and I, you know, really was just sort of curious about your opinion of traditional print games journalism being kind of slowly eclipsed by YouTube and like Twitch content creators. And I know you as a game creator have probably seen this unfold as well, but probably from a different lens. Yeah, um, so I, 
So uh, the, the reason I'm pausing is because you said uh, slowly eclipsed. And uh, I know for Bethesda, it was a very sudden thing where mm. they at some point decided we are no longer going to be going through the same procedure we do at the press because we've discovered that um, uh, content creators and uh, influencers respond faster and they're usually more positive about our games. And then they're like, well, what do we need the press for? Then? And um, because, you know, press will take time to review a game. Like they, you know, uh, I guess my point is, um, I think the, what ends up happening though, is that there's a one generation transition period that gets on because what will happen is, or what has happened is when you start relying more on, influencers in the community which i don't think is a bad thing um and you take away something the press were used to like hey well like we were going to show you the game and demo this and you know make it a big production and uh and then you remove that i think that there's growing pains with that where like the press realizes something's being taken from them and that adjustment period can sometimes not be good for a company like so part of me was examining the reviews for various Bethesda projects after that happened. I'm like, I wonder if part of the reason this Metacritic score is the way it is, is because the press are kind of lashing back against the procedures mm -hmm. that Bethesda is now using. Now, I think after one generation transitions, I don't think anyone's going to care anymore. Um, but right now, I think that um, there could be some uh, consequences that result from that. And one of them could be just lower review scores mm -hmm. or because you weren't keeping the press up to date with the game and explaining your decisions, which I, you know, which is informative, but if you're not giving that information like you used to, then the press have less, have less to work with. And, and then there's some press, I think that would negatively react to that. Um, so I, I think that's something that, that, could be happening yeah and i think it's also um worth mentioning the negatives in the in in the sense of now if it is shifting towards youtube or twitch or whatever else anybody can theoretically make a review and anybody can then theoretically make yep. a video and that also yep. has problems in itself because you know what i've noticed unfold in front of my eyes really what kind of inspired me to want to make a channel myself was seeing people take dollars from developers and then yeah. try and pretend that they weren't biased about it and it's just like for yeah. me if you're promoting something just promote it and you know get get that over with don't make it seem like you're actually organically coming to a decision that you like something because then you start to wonder yeah you know? and um i will say like the paychecks they go to some influence seem to be insane like you know good for them but uh I, I, I'm curious if this trend will mutate into something more evil, but, uh, I, I'm basically all forgiving. Like if he wants to have a voice you about any sort of game, that's great. But I think like, like you were saying, like there's a certain responsibility that before you give a review, you should say, Hey, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a paid employee or contractor of, <laughs> of this organization and, or, you know, I received this game for free. Like even something as simple as receive, receiving a review code mm -hmm. because you didn't spend 60 bucks for it. I hate to say like, it's, it's the truth. Your, your opinion is affected by that. Cause like there are people that like base their opinions on games and rightfully so on the amount that they had to pay for them. Like, and like, it's like I spent 60 bucks in this game, but for like a four, if, but it felt like a $40 experience. Like I I've seen people take that, perspective and i think that they're correct like a dollar value for a game gives a certain expectation it can be positive or negative like if you're if you end up delivering a 60 dollars experience but you're only charging 19.99 the the positive feedback you can get from that is amazing um but if you get a free review code like you've removed that part of valuation from the process and i think that's problematic and and a reviewer should make mention of that i think what's nice is um on steam they they do have that indicator of, hey right. by the way I'm, I'm doing this review but i did get this product for free right i've seen that as well and th that is like at least a step into uh the the right direction um I, I guess the last thing that i have um here really is just uh what is your opinion of kind of gaming work crunch or sorry sorry I, i'm reading this question out loud what is your opinion <laughs> on gaming work 
French culture. It's funny. Reading questions out loud is more difficult to me than just saying them off the top of my head. But I wanted to be prepared. So here I am. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, just what's your opinion on um, crunch culture and in, in, in the, I uh, guess, development I, field itself? Completely unnecessary. Uh, whenever there's crunch, it's a failure of management. Um, I, I've been guilty of working more than 40 hours because I, I get involved and passionate about, cause I, like, I, I, I love doing design. Um, but at the same time, I think the problem with that is that when you're doing more than 40 hours of work, um, it can have, uh, consequences on your health it can have consequences on, um, attention to detail. It can create more work for other people who actually had a normal schedule, like it might, requ- it might cost more time from art or QA to flesh out all these new elements that you put in. So you have to be careful with that. My opinion is that um, no one should ever have to work more than 40 hours a week. Um, if they do, then you should be downscoping the game or adding more resources to compensate for that. You don't have them work more hours. Um, another problem I've seen with crunch culture is this is unfortunately usually with larger publishers is they did one game in the distant past that they crunched the hell out of to get done. They got an amazing review score, a ton of copies, and then they took the wrong lesson from it, where it's like, oh, crunch works for us. No, it doesn't. <laughs> what you should do is take all those re- and like all the money you earned make a better team structure that's a little bit more balanced like don't like crunch isn't the reason your game was successful like it may have forced it out and faster which is also bad but it's not really it's not really indicative of a good pipeline or production process it's it's it just means you're not being managed properly and um you know it can be the the reasons for that crunch can just be abysmal. Like maybe marketing weighed in too early or too late, or you know, a, a senior management comes in and they want you to pivot on a certain idea that they could have told you about their passion, or they suddenly decide they want voice acting for the game. No, never ever any intention to do that, and then like suddenly you've discovered this huge crap load of work dumped on you that absolutely does cause. Crunch because of how it was introduced and how it was managed. And in short, I never think it's necessary and it's a failure. That That's a bold statement, but it, I mean, I think it's kind of hard to disagree having been a project manager myself in construction, you know, before I started doing this whole YouTube thing um, for six years or so. I, I mean, anytime we ever crunched, that meant overtime. So it was good for us because we were a contractor who was paid to work more, right? But when you're not paid to work more, then we never worked more. So <laughs> I guess um, <laughs> it was a little bit different in construction because you know it's a different culture probably. But also, like you said, people got away with it once. It kind of sets a precedent, and then people were like, oh, "I'm, I'm gonna start doing this more often." You know, maybe this will work in the future. Um, yep. To, I guess some closing thoughts, though. The, the last question I have for you, and you, you touched on this a bit um, when we first started speaking. Why do you create, and what would you say inspires you to create more <laughs> stories in video games? Uh, so this is similar to a question that uh, you know, I, I got from a, a budding game developer. It was like, hey, like, uh, like how did you get started in writing? Like, how, did, how did you know you wanted to be a writer uh, uh, for the game industry? And I'm like, well, and my answer was like, I... Man, I, I really didn't have a choice. I just stuff. And when you like doing it enough, like you really can't not do it. Like yeah. Yeah. you may not make money at it. Like you may like you know, 24-7, but you, you love it so much you just can't help yourself. And I think that that's the way it is with me. Like it, it's fun. It's fun to build world. It's fun to, you know, create characters. And then to have someone else like interacting in that space and then see like, you know, how they how they deal with certain challenges or like you know the how they how they it, it's basically like I, I enjoy being a pen and, i enjoy being a pen and paper i enjoy being a digital game master and i think it's uh it's just something that i just can't can't not do that's an interesting uh way to put it a digital game master 
<laughs> you're just yeah, you're a dm for every yeah, game <laughs> yeah i say that just because like there's so many tabletop experiences for being a gm i think trained me really well for being a digital version like you learn a lot more respect for players i think when you're around them at a gaming table and you also get feedback a lot faster as to what's entertaining them and what's not and if you do that for like 10 or 15 years suddenly you'll realize you have a lot of skill sets that you can bring into the digital space um, even if you can't see your players immediately or you'll just see their feedback online but you can avoid a lot of the pitfall that made adventures you ran in the past not entertaining yeah and that's actually that that was related to a question that i didn't ask you but i sent to you about the whole um something about going back to the old school pen and paper style rpg seems to be successful i mean it, it continues to be successful that means that there's some kind of magic there there's something that they did right that people keep learning from and so it's so whatever that reason in particular is i don't know but i saw some of it myself when you know i was there on the floor and talking to people and hearing them basically tell me that hey i love rp uh, RPing in a D and D style game, or maybe even in Neverwinter Nights, just because it's cool that I can be somebody else completely and then yeah. role play as this character, and it's like that's just unique. And you might say, yeah. and me being a big MMO fan, I want to say that you can get that in an MMO, but you can't really. Like the role play community, which is kind of the whole point of role playing games, is uh, sadly uh, missing in a lot of these games. Yeah, the uh, for, for the pen and paper aspect. Like, uh, I'm really envious of RPG culture today, uh, especially in the pen and paper space, because, like, when I was growing up, playing D&D basically meant you would be getting your ass kicked at school every day. And <laughs> that, that, that was an eye-opening experience where, like, you didn't really brag about the fact you were doing it because you would just get the, you know, the shit kicked out of you. The, um, and so and now, now Geek I and see, Sundry does 30K oh, a month. God. I'm like, you don't know how lucky <laughs> I like, I just want to shout to the world and go, you know what? Like you guys, like a critical role, like I am really glad this has taken off and people are loving it and they're getting involved, but man, it wasn't always like that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, thank God that pen and paper gaming is being celebrated by people that enjoy it. And it's being, and it's not seen as a, you know, a dismissive activity or a, or a target for attempt. They, they see it as something fun that you can do with your friends and like and the critical role is like a prime example of this like it, there are so many followers that get really interested in it. like the, the the players get interested into it it's a it shows how fun it is and i think that's been a real help to both pen and paper and digital um and digital games because like suddenly the stigma of playing D D is kind of evolved past that to something that hey it's okay to play this and not only is it okay to play it but actually it's cool yeah exactly and i mean i'm very, I'm very jealous <laughs> I, I i am as well just you know geek and sundry in general they're pretty impressive to me and frankly speaking i i like their idea of doing live content i hope someday i can do the same thing with uh, mafia which is my favorite game my favorite party game but uh <laughs> i don't know if it'll be as exciting as D, &D and i'm definitely not going to have matthew mercer <laughs> as my dm <laughs> <laughs> but um all right so I, I honestly i could talk to you for much longer but i, I don't want to take too much more of your time um i i just can use this time though to uh, first thank you for stopping by and, and answering all of these questions. Um, we're glad to have you on episode 30 of the Six Pixels Under podcast. But then also maybe use this time to have like a social media shout out, um, tell people what to look out for next, where they can find you and uh, goodbyes and all that, you know, good stuff. Well, Justin, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, it's been a great conversation. So thanks for I hope some of these answers were interesting. <laughs> they were, absolutely. And um, I think your Twitter is just at Chris Avalon, right? Yeah. And uh, if anyone out there has ever, uh, ever wants any sort of uh, game advice or any sort of like how to break into writing or, or writing tips that I, I can, I'm more than happy to share all the writing mistakes I've made in the interests of not letting anyone else repeat them. And also because when I was trying to get in the industry, no one would ever answer questions. So if you wow. have a question wow. and now that I'm in the industry, I would like to change that. <laughs> so I'm always happy to try and answer questions when my schedule permits. Wow, that I mean that's that's pretty awesome. It's it that I honestly I felt the exact same way. It's weird you say that. Growing up I saw 
a lot of different YouTubers never answer my questions. So I always made it a point now to try and answer everybody else's questions. <laughs> so I guess one one person at a time uh, matters. And uh, I wanted to also add my moderator in particular probably will contact you. <laughs> <laughs> He's been looking Great. for some help. So um, <laughs> thank you first for offering that. And also thank you for your time again. Uh, it was awesome having you on the podcast. and. Um, someday I'm sure we'll meet at an event. I'd love to do that. In fact, I, I miss you when you did a, a talk once. You did a talk. Oh. I, I can't remember exactly where it was, but did you I were hear, on a panel. You heard the convention? It, it might have been. No, it wasn't Rooster Teeth. No. Oh, wait a minute. Um, was it? It wasn't Rooster Teeth, right? RTX yeah. and no. Oh All I God, know is just... South yeah, by Southwest it... Gaming. Yes, that I've I've been there a few times. Yeah, okay. We did one pitch panel, and I think there might have been another writing panel at some point. Yeah, we got some really awkward pitches during that panel. So actually, <laughs> I probably, missed it. Oh, uh, it was it was. We weren't even sure how to respond to something. Like that. So, <laughs> like, Whoa. Um, but yeah, so maybe you didn't miss anything, and I tape the taping of it's up somewhere but yeah but uh i'm sure we will cross paths i'm looking forward to it yeah uh that, that'll be awesome and uh don't be alarmed but i am a giant and i might be dressed as a detective so i'm not going to investigate you or anything <laughs> but you can point me in the right direction <laughs> it'd be my pleasure <laughs> all right uh thanks for having uh or thanks for i guess joining us and um i see you later really i mean yeah thank you <laughs> see you later right, have a good rest of your monday all right you too see you later Wow. Okay. Well, that was <laughs> that was something. Um, let me make sure I've got the right um, panel here. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It's hard not to get nervous when you're talking to essentially the guy who's created your favorite games. <laughs> um, you know, at first I was not nervous, but then later on I started to realize, man, this is kind of a crazy, surreal experience. You know. I think for, if you guys can, I can kind of tell you all the story more. So I wasn't able to tell him the entire story because of the audio difficulties. But, you know, when I was 13 years old and I played KOTOR 2, Knights of the, Knights of the, old, Knights of the old Republic 2, sorry. Um, I'm running out of uh, saliva here. But when I was playing KOTOR 2, it was this new experience that I had never really, you know, been a part of before basically a game that made me question morality in real life that had never happened to me i never thought that a video game could be you know able to do such a thing i had played tons of great uh, great games as a kid halo played uh legend of zelda played um street fighter i played tons of great games uh the mutant ninja turtle game what is it super mutant ninja turtle super mutant ninja turtles on the sega genesis or what was that game called on the Sega Genesis with the um, with the super mutant Ninja turtle dude? I, maybe it was just called that. But anyway, I, I used to I played tons of great games, but Kotor was the first time that I really was just like, huh. So you're telling me that this person could actually not be bad? It's not black and white, right? And so. That carried on into my later years, of course, but also I played many more games after that. And since then, I always had a particular desire for creators, writers, and designers who weren't thinking just strictly in the box. You know, I like people who are not just, not even thinking about the box. Let's put it that way. I like when a writer is just like, okay, here's the story, here's the narrative, and let's find a way to make it happen. And I kind of like when that's led by a single creative, maybe even just like a, a team of support roles or whatever else. But that's kind of rare to see. I mean, Chris even said it himself to us that a lot of, you know, relationships now in, in development, they're not exactly going to be that um, uh, allowing to have one creative vision. It's going to be a lot of different people trying to vote on some sort of like committee or board or whatever it is. It's a lot of suits making decisions. So it's pretty difficult to be able to do that um, with just one creative in this current day and age. But that being said, you know, I, I think that there's obvious uh, strengths to that. And it's just, it's still crazy to think about that I, I got to interview somebody who was really the first time I ever really was into a game. And what I mean by that is that I played StarCraft a lot as a kid, and I was definitely addicted to that game. 
But KOTOR 2 was the first time that an RPG kind of made me really question life, you know? And after that, I found many games that did that. Neverwinter Nights, Neverwinter Nights 2, um, Planescape Torment, Dragon Age. Um, there's tons of games like that. Star Wars Galaxies, Guild Wars. What am I missing here? Tons of different games made me question other things, but it was the, it was the first time that I had seen it in that game. And so uh, it's always interesting to have an experience like that. But it also, I think, this talk kind of opened me up to the idea that, ultimately speaking, that's the relationship that I prefer to have with a developer, is where I'm, I'm just genuinely interested in the kind of work that they're working on, and it's not really about selling a product. We don't have a relationship where he's like, hey, can you sell my product? You know, it's more of like when I can bring somebody onto the show and do an interview with them and, and even just meet them in person. I, I did this with Daniel Erickson, actually, uh, from SWOTOR. I had the chance to meet him at um, PAX 2011. And I think it was Prime at the time. And him and a couple other of the ma main devs at the time. I think even Drew was there. But I can't really remember because this is one of the first like on the show floor type of events that they had. And I remember I got to have just like a pint with Daniel Erickson. And it was just like, I much prefer that type of meeting a developer than the whole you're meeting somebody where it's kind of like you're trying to navigate what you can talk about, what you can't talk about. It's too official. And then it just seems kind of contrived and forced. And I think that's kind of why these days developers don't really have relationships with a lot of um, print media anymore because it, they don't really see a whole lot of positives to it. I don't think so um, in many ways. I mean, you look at the whole Jason uh, Schreier situation, and if it wasn't for the help of those developers uh, who were working at Bioware to kind of sound the alarm, we wouldn't even really know about this whole story. So there is still some benefits to it, and, and there are still some relationships that exist. They're just not nearly as common as they um, used to be. And I think it's because things are trending more towards content creation and YouTubers and that sort of stuff, it's up to us YouTubers to form relationships with developers and companies ourselves personally. And um, it's not always going to work. I mean, some companies are just simply going to be like, you need to make me dollars and cents, and that's really all I care. And that's sort of why I don't do sponsored videos on my channel. It's sort of like, I don't want somebody to take away the creative freedom or to make somebody question my integrity on something. I want people to know that, hey, even if he's wrong, he's wrong. Not because he was told something and he believed it because he was getting paid or whatever else. I just realized, is my chat even here? Okay, here it is. Thanks for the uh, stream. Yeah, no problem, Zila. No problem. That was an amazing one. Yeah, that, <laughs> that one was difficult for sure. Good job, man. You did. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Carlo Lucas. And thanks as well, uh, Dynamics and uh, Card. Super Bunny Hop made similar scoops. It isn't exclusively for print media. No, no, that's a good point. You can do good journalism simply just by asking people, but it's just like that doesn't really happen because you have to ask a lot of people. There's just a lot of people to, to ask, and then you don't know if like maybe they'll sound the alarm that you're asking questions. Like There is some level of risk. And as a journalist, like the, the main risk that you have is being blackballed. That's the worst thing that could happen to you. If you were working for a big print media company and Bethesda was like, hey, we're, we are going to revoke your press credentials, that would be huge. I mean, you might even get fired, right? Because like if you can't cover a main game, which is probably the main way that that you know, particular website makes money, you can't, you know I mean, what are you going to do? So it's like, it's different now that developers and publishers can go directly to content creators so it's better in the sense that we can hear directly from somebody who's actually played the game or has an intimate history or maybe isn't so biased and their sole purpose isn't to sell advertisement or sell you know copies of the game but at the same time are people infallible no people can make mistakes so ultimately people can still be influenced and I think that's kind of where I'm sitting right now is I'm a little bit afraid about how much money is being exchanged in YouTube because it's like how are you so confident that what you're seeing is what you're getting? I guess is my question. Like, how are you so confident that the types of reviews that you see and whatever types of video content you see is really like real? Like maybe they like it because of something else. Like it's just, it's hard to know for sure. And when things aren't so cut and dry, like they are typically from like uh, major gaming, you know, websites and media outlets, it's more transparent with them because you know what you're expecting. 
you know that they have a relationship you know they got a review copy you know they had a number of you know weeks usually days to do a review you kind of know the circumstances with each individual review you kind of have to make that decision on your own and while i will say ultimately i think it's better that content creators and people like me kind of took over the space i think it's better because you guys can trust us more than you can trust them <laughs> um but at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can just blindly trust every content creator. You still have to be the one to uh, make that decision yourself. Is this person trustworthy or not? There's no third person party, right? There's no, me not, not medium, but there's no a filter. There's no filter. So you don't know necessarily if what you're getting is truthful or if it's just or whatever other, you know, concerns that you have. You don't really know that. And so um, there are some downsides, I think, to content creators kind of taking over in the space. But um, anyway, just uh, getting my thoughts out there, I guess, on that particular subject. It says I'm already subbed to the channel and it won't let me. Pro Someone probably gifted you a sub, is my guess, basic brute. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Vice, I, I appreciate that. But I agree with your uh, point. There is a lot of red tape from what it seems. As long as there's clear discourse, then you can at least be critical of what you are seeing. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that just because you take a sponsored video, you're a bad person. I mean, let, let me put this out there. Lazy Peon, um, I've supported his journey and will continue to support his journey. He's an MMO YouTuber, a pretty popular one. In fact, probably one of the most popular uh, YouTubers who does MMO content. And he does sponsored videos. But why don't I have a problem with it? Well, because he does impressions. Like when you do impressions and somebody's paying you to do an impression, there's not a whole lot of red tape there that can be kind of crossed, you know? It's very clear what you're getting. You're getting a couple of hours of an impression from a game that you don't know necessarily if it's good or not. He's just forming his opinion kind of as he goes on the spot. So I don't feel as bad about it in the case of, you know, it basically it depends on the type of content. For my type of video, how could I do a death of a game while also, you know, taking money from a company? I, I mean, I can't even say it with a straight face because that's how comical it is to me. Like, could you imagine like trying to do a, a retrospective or a um, obituary of sorts, like a, a um, what do you want to say? Like a, a forensics case. Whenever somebody, like the person that you, maybe is the person tampering with the evidence is the one paying you, like it just, there's just too many, you know, wires being crossed in that type of uh, scenario. I don't see how I could ever do that. <laughs> he only does that. He only does ones that let him give his honest opinion. Oh, I didn't know that. Doesn't surprise me. I mean, I, I trust Lazy Peon. I met him in person, talked with him a lot. He seems pretty transparent about what he thinks and what he believes. So if you ever have a concern with somebody like... By the way, it says Chris Avalon down here. I am not Chris Avalon, so let me move that out of the way. <laughs> I'm surprised uh, Card didn't say anything. He's probably, he's probably too tired. Or just laughing, seeing how long it took me to realize it. <laughs> as long as the sponsored video is disclosed via thumbnail title at the start of the video or at the top of the description, then I have no problem with it. And if that's your standard, I think that's perf perfectly fair. That's perfectly fair to have that kind of standard. I think where I kind of draw a little bit of um, concern from is like when somebody is um, covering things, but they're also taking money on Patreon, it's sort of like... Okay, so you do sponsored videos, you get ad revenue, and then you also want me to pay you some amount of money on Patreon. So it's sort of like, are you trying to dip into everything here? And what I mean to tell you guys from the perspective of a content creator who's behind the scenes, right? When you do sponsored videos, you do them for one reason in particular. They allow you to create content and make videos that are going to do well typically uh, population or sorry views wise typically because they're a newer product right especially if you're going to be you know specific in which ones you take um, so it allows you to be specific right lazy peon doesn't have to do a sponsored video for everything ever right he only does the ones on things that he thinks that he could find at least some interest in so it allows you to not have to rely on the popularity game while also making money off of sponsored videos but if you have a major push towards patreon as well then it's sort of like, 
what is your business model? You make ad revenue, you make money off of people who provide you money uh, on Patreon, but then you're also making money from developers based on sponsored videos. So you're like triple dipping. It's, I mean, it, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's kind of like, I'm not saying it's bad necessarily. I'm just saying it's, it is what it is. Like when somebody's doing that or they're making X amount of money on YouTube already and you know how much money they make and they're still asking for that extra amount on Patreon or wherever other platform they take it, you have to be uh, cognizant of like, what am I getting for this? Like, am I, am I just willing to support this person and I don't care where this money goes? Or do I expect something from this? Because I oftentimes find that people sometimes don't have any expectation. They just want to help somebody out. And that's cool. And that totally works. But I think it's better to be kind of upfront for, with what you're supporting. Are you supporting the creation of future content? You just want to support this guy as a person. You know, what are you supporting exactly? And that's sort of why I like Patreon um, over sponsored videos is Patreon is a more personal relationship with my audience because I directly form a relationship with you whenever you sign up as a patron, right? So I have access to your email. I can, I can uh, send you a message, right? Um, I can give you a discount, whatever, whatever other types of relationships. It's a direct relationship I have with my own customer. Or, you know, if you want to put it that way, it sounds weird putting it that way, but that's the business term, right? Let's just say my patron, which is what the Patreon platform calls it. My patron is somebody that I'm forming a personal relationship with. They know my content. They know that it's niche. And so they're supporting the fact that it is niche. So then therefore, I don't have to focus on relying on popularity or on other platforms. That's why I like the Patreon focus myself is it, it's kind of like, well, you know, I'm not going to take money from all these other different companies and you know, I'm not going to do loads of sponsored videos and whatever else, because that's just not type of con or that's not my type of content. Um, and it's not what I'm interested in just from a personal standpoint, but also integrity standpoint, I'd rather have, a you know, my own autonomy, really, I want to make my own decisions and I want to be able to have my own opinions and formulate them on my own without influence, if you know what I mean, dollar dollar bill. So that, that's sort of why I, if you guys are ever, ever wondering why I had this recent push towards Patreon, that's why it's so I don't have to focus really on making the next popular video, I can make the next video that you guys want me to make or the video that I want to make, which is ultimately, you know, in this case, the video that you guys want me to make. <laughs> um, so it, it, it helps uh, in that sense. But it's also because I have gotten offers to do sponsored videos and I just never could think about a way that I could do it in a way that I felt like it fit with my content or I really like felt good about it, I guess I would say. So this is not for me to be on my moral high horse and look down at those who don't do it the way I do it. I'm just explaining my reasoning for why I do it the way that I do it, really, which is just so I don't have any wires crossed myself. It's just clear, cut and dry. I'm making content for people who want me to make content. I'm not making content for a developer and then I'm not making content for a publisher. I still think you should get a sponsor on here. There's stuff that you already use. Yeah, well, first, let me say I'm not against sponsorships. But sponsorships for me have to be something that I believe is more personal than maybe most are willing to offer because I don't want to just see somebody as like, okay, they're giving me something, but they don't really give a shit about me nor my vision. I'm not really looking for relationships like that. Otherwise, I could have had them already. I'm looking for something that's more so I know what to expect from my sponsor and they know what to expect from me. I want I want to build a relationship. Like I actually want to build a relationship with a sponsor so I can talk to them whenever I want to do a giveaway for a particular event, for a tournament, for a video or whatever else, I can speak to them directly. I'm not speaking through like a liaison of a liaison to the other guy. You know what I mean? Like it's not like some affiliate deal where I have to buy the product myself and then hope they give me a discount. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I, I want something that's more personal so I can also use that relationship um, to benefit you guys as well. Because in this case, like, if if somebody's sending me peripherals, do I need 16 mouses in my house? Like, or sorry, mice in my house? No, not real ones and and not fake ones. But uh, I can give the 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 fake ones away, right? Because um, the real ones are for my lizards. I actually don't like feeding the mice to my lizard, just because it's like a pain in the ass to deal with. Yeah, Rode did give me this microphone. So I'm going to be needing a new one soon. So any sponsors out there who are willing to hook me up with a nice cardioid uh, mic or what's the other one called? 
There's the Cardiode and the um, XLR. If you could get me one of those with an amp as well, might as well throw in an amp as well. Hey, I will shill whatever product it is, as long as it's good, of course. <laughs> you can give me some advice. Yeah, I'm sure you can, Card. In fact, if I'm going to end up purchasing it, which I probably will at this point, um, I'll go to you specifically. I'll tell you what my price range is, and we can see what we can figure it out. Audio Technica 2035 XLR mark or XLR mic with a good audio interface. <laughs> Focus right. I know you're out there. Hit the man up with a free Scarlet box. <laughs> What's a Scarlet box? I'm gonna Google that. <clears throat> Oh, it's an actual uh, amp. I thought you were just memeing. No, you were being serious. This is an actual company who actually makes uh, amps. Interesting. Have I tried the game One Finger Death Punch? No, <laughs> I don't think I have. Is it like a flicking game or something? That's what it sounds like. All right, now everyone's just going to start listing things, and I'm going to have to start looking them up. Uh, sorry, looking them up, and I'm going to realize that you're just trolling me. <laughs> Anyway, I think it's uh, reached a good point at the end of the podcast. Did, did any of you guys have any questions you want to ask me while I'm here in, you know, in chat still? Um, no, no voiceover today, no call-ins, but you can just at me if you have any questions in the Twitch chat. I'll go ahead and uh, answer those now. But only for a couple more minutes, by the way. So maybe like uh, six more minutes or so. Burrito Bandits asks, Hey, uh, NS, I randomly came across your Death of a Game series on YouTube and was immediately hooked and began going back through your video log and watching all of your podcasts. Keep up the great work. Hey, I appreciate that. I didn't know anybody was going back and watching the old podcast episodes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate that. And I, uh, I admire the people who were able to get through my old Death of a Games. Maybe I'm just, you know, biased, but I can't get through them. My voice sounds weird. It's super like poorly edited because I edited it myself. <laughs> uh, it has like clipping constantly, like weird background noise. Yeah, I, I can't even get through my old stuff. That's another reason why we made it this big goal on the uh, Patreon is um, then we can actually take the time to go and redo those things. And it's not going to be a matter of is it worth the cost? Because, you know, it will be worth the cost essentially. You did as well, Rammies. All right, well, you and Burrito Bandits, I appreciate that. And speaking of that, Burrito Bandits, you got me hungry, man. I need a burrito right now. Let me go find one of those. Uh, Kasapi85 says, Hey, Nerd Slayer, random question. Have you played Outward? I have not, and I've seen it, but I guess nothing really hooked me into joining it because I'm just like, why would I play Outward when I can just play Mountain Blade, right? I don't know. I know I'm going to be waiting until, like, another Ice Age to play the newest uh, Warband game, but I'd rather just wait and just play that one. I think it's going to be much, 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 much better and surely polished. They take forever to make games, but they make them very polished, I would say. And if they don't, the community kind of picks up the pieces anyway. <laughs> Hey, wait, don't tell them that card. Keep that behind uh, closed doors. <laughs> we don't want any labor laws or anything. <laughs> As for Death of a Game, I've listened to them all. I didn't find them anything close to awful. I'm very, very sensitive to sound now that I've gotten these really, you know, nice headphones. So I can hear like any little cackling, any little cracking of a mic, like especially when you listen to your own voice so much. I can hear any little imperfection in my voice. And so when you guys don't even notice things, I notice them and they drive me crazy. So when I mispronounce something or I, you know, mess up on a word, trust me, if it annoys you, it annoys me even greater. I just, you know, obviously I'm not going to post on my own videos that I'm m making mistakes at certain parts unless I find the mistake and it's like an egregious mistake or whatever else. But I'm not going to be like, out here I, I slightly had the wrong cadence when I should have brought it down. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to analyze my own voice. I'd be analyzing for a long time. Outward definitely polishes the, uh, or it definitely needs polish, but it scratches my fantasy RPG itch. 
then why not just go play Mountain Blade? Have you ever played that game? I mean, it's pretty cheap to play the, uh, these days, and there's tons of mods. You can play a Game of Thrones mod. You can play a Lord of the Rings mod. There's a Star Wars mod. There's um, the Pelosi Kingdom or whatever it's called. Uh, is it Pel Pelosigrad? Or I can't remember what that very famous mod is, but it's like something with a P. Why do games have such problems optimizing performance when there's 20 to 30 on a server? Example, GTA Online, max 32 players, but games like UO and EQ never had issues. Well, part of that is because GTA is not designed as an online game originally. It's designed as a single player game. So they had to like port it to a multiplayer environment, which means that, you know, it has a whole lot of other issues. If you remember something Chris Avalon said in particular about game engines, sometimes a game engine just isn't really suited for something. And say, for example, maybe in GTA's case, it's not really suited to be an online game. So maybe that's why it has problems in that respect. Whereas um, EQ and UO have much simpler um, design elements, much simpler UI, much simpler graphics, and probably much easier to run, and then therefore specifically made to run on the internet. So it's like um, the difference between why doesn't my, I don't know, my basic Ford 250 drive faster than my Ford like 150 Raptor. It's like, well, the Raptor, although it's a lesser version, you know, two to 150, it's a souped up version. So it's still faster, right? I thought Mountain Blade wasn't fantasy. Oh, there's tons of ways to fix that, dude. There's tons of mods you can download. If you want to shoot spells, you can shoot spells. Trust me, there's a mod for it in that game. Hey, what's up, uh, you Omoified? You Omoified. I always like that name. I always had trouble pronouncing it, though. You Omoified. There you go. I got it perfect three times in a row. Okay, I'm phasing out of here. I think we're out of questions, and I'm not going to make cards sit here any longer, nor myself. And plus, you guys have been um, here since the beginning, really. We stayed around 33 to maybe 28 to 30 viewers or so. We hovered around the same amount. So I want to thank all of you for first taking the time to stop by. I know it was a bit of a later one today, so sorry for my EU listeners. Um, but for my NA listeners, I know you're probably listening to it at work, which you shouldn't be doing right now, dude. No, just kidding. But thank you also, my NA uh, listeners as well. Um, once again, thanks out to Chris um, Avalon for stopping by and doing an interview with us. And uh, you know, thanks to everybody who helped me set it up, including Card, Zila, myself, and then also Chris and yeah, that's pretty much all my thanks, all my goodbyes and all my hellos and whatever else. See you guys later. Till next time.